This is the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. The biggest, the biggest icon in podcasting. Welcome in everybody to this week's edition of Doc and Jock. I am the Doc, John Macaroon. Super excited to fire up the microphones, turn on the lights here at the Sterling Heights office. Man, a lot of good things to talk about with the Detroit Lions. So much to get into. College football kicks off. It's been really weird, the buildup and my personal reaction to it. Michigan State, I think, has done probably maybe even arguably one of the worst jobs of hyping up their season in the history of hype. And we live in an age of hype where we can make shit look like chicken salad in an instant. Michigan State is just like, well, people don't like us. They don't like our coach. They don't like our roster. Fuck it, let's not even try to sell any hope. Let's just let everybody talk about a five-win team forever with no hype. It was crazy. So we're going to talk about that in the second half of the podcast another week more suspensions for Michigan let's see how Adam's going to react to what the hell has been going on with the Wolverines as they approach the cupcake portion of their schedule which you can argue is maybe the entire schedule but we got to talk about it the Lions in a crazy way of course two hours after the four o'clock deadline officially released their 53-man roster and it was crazy luckily I read between the tea leaves, and one of the reporters said, yeah, it's probably not going to come out for a couple hours. So it was so perfect, cuz, because I had a 5.30 appointment with my kid meeting the teacher. So I'm like, okay, we got to get in, we got to get out. Uh, My 9-year-old is a talker, and I'm like, oh, my God, this is what it's going to be like. This is what Adam must be dealing with when he hears me talk and ramble for five minutes at a time. My kid wants to talk, and I'm like, oh, shoot, I got to get back to my computer by 6 because the roster's coming out. And we get in there, and she's looking around, and everything's going on, and it's 540. I'm like, okay, this is good. And inevitably, I go to my kid's school a thousand times. I never see any of her friends, any of her friends' parents. Roster cut down day. I see a couple parents, and the first thing they say, they don't even check on me. They're like, what are you doing? Why aren't you, ch- why aren't you telling us who's getting the roster cut? I'm like, thank you, too. I'm fine. I got a lot going on. <laughs> but that's what you're worried about? I'm like, it's 6 o'clock. They're like, okay, thanks. So I go in, go into the kid's classroom for about 10 minutes, get all the information. I walk down, and two more parents feel the need to greet me. And I'm like, oh, shit. And so uh, get out of the parking lot at 5.57, trying to be – respectful of the speed limit laws, get back to the house at 6.01, and luckily the Lions released it at like 6.03, and you know, we have our ways and information gathering and all that kind of stuff. We had the roster stuff within five minutes because the Lions had it first, of course, which is smart. They feed the info to the team reporter. He had it out. We just had our our, our template in place. We go boop, 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 and within five minutes we had the ro- and and thank you guys for consuming it at such a high level. You blew up the website. It was great. I love that you guys are just all about the Lions. It makes it fun to talk about the Lions with Adam, too, on the podcast and all the ways in which we can talk about the Lions on social media, websites, podcasts. You guys are going crazy about the unbalanced roster here. Now, the as, we, as Adam and I are recording, the practice squad's getting all put together. So I'm curious. You've seen it. What's your first reaction of the Lions? Initial. It's going to change. Over time here, over the next even maybe 48 hours when we put this out. But the initial roster, the first one that came out, what'd you think? I was surprised, especially looking at the way this roster is balanced. You know, ideally, you've got 53 men. Three of those guys are usually a special teams unit. Ideally, you'd go 25 and 25, 25 offense, 25 defense. This team didn't do that. I believe it's, what, 21 and, and 29 for defense? So this this roster is stacked on the defensive side of the ball. And I think when you start to kind of delve into it a little bit, for me, it raises a couple of red flags as far as a couple of the subunits on the offense. And we're going to get into that in a little bit. But I was really shocked. I, I thought this would be a much more balanced team And it really feels like it is defensively heavy. And if you were to tell me a year ago 
when this team had arguably the worst defense in the NFL, uh, even after they went on their, there was like an eight game, eight out of nine game win streak or nine out of 10 game win streak. After they went on that win streak, this team still ranked in the bottom three in a lot of defensive categories. If you were to tell me a year ago today that I would be feeling much more optimistic about the defense than I do about the offense. I would tell you that you're absolutely crazy. I would tell you that the offense is light years ahead of where the defense is and the defense has a ton of catching up to do. Well, in one off season, this team has rebuilt this defense and I feel very good about this defense and you see a ton of depth on the defense, whether it's defensive line, whether it's the cornerback unit, whether it's the safeties, the, 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 the edge rushers, like there are guys who made this team, that I'm surprised made this team. There are guys on this team that I thought that this team would definitely have tried to trade. I mean, you've got both of the Acquire brothers, and for weeks, those guys were mentioned as possible trade commodities, and yet they found their way on this roster. So they had really good preseasons, so it's a good thing, right? It's, it's not a bad thing, but just a little surprised at how they allocated a lot of these roster spots. I th- was a little bit shocked with the division of the roster with – the offense really kind of almost being shortchanged, it feels like, and the defense being so deep and so thick with guys. Uh, it, it was interesting to me, and like I said, it was a little bit surprising. What was your initial takeaway? Yeah, 21 offensive players, only 10 reserves. That, it, is, it is a little bit jarring to see, and there are obviously inherently some things to debate because, yeah, maybe one of the Aquara brothers didn't need to be on the roster, Will Harris, uh, Cabinda. I think the other thing too is only two running backs. I don't, you know, obviously, yeah. you know, some roster manipulation could take place if the Lions decide to put Iffy on IR or Julian Aquara, then you can easily re-sign Craig Reynolds. And you're seeing now, I get it. I think the Lions gambled and they said, "Look, we probably are going to lose one or two players, but the NFL nowadays is such an intricate system-oriented type thing that there's no patience." in trying to really go out and add players from another team. So the Lions feel like, you know what? Our system is kind of maybe put together in a way where if we let people go, we have a good chance of having the pick of the litter of the 16 guys we want on the practice squad. And I'm I, to be honest, I'm a little bit surprised nobody uh, wanted to, you know, uh, a deal wasn't struck with Chase Lucas or, or others that have been released right away. You heard Sterling, uh, Starling Thomas get claimed by the Cardinals, but that's the only one so far, I think, officially, with the names that have been released, is the only player that the Lions moved on from and, and waived that has been claimed by another team. Now, yeah, the veterans, obviously, Covington and Effetti, the linemen, they ended up going back to you know scenarios that were familiar. So I look at it and I say, you know what? It's, it's not terrible at first, because I don't think it's going to end up being this way forever. Uh, there's no way the Lions are going to the Chiefs with two running backs. There's no way, uh, especially in a league that's off. Uh, uh, you know, we could talk about it because, you know, it's an offensive league and the Lions loaded up on defense. So it is a little bit of a gamble in that the idealistic viewpoint is, yeah, the Lions defense is going to be physical, violent. They want to hit. They want to force turnovers. But is the league going to allow that brand of football without throwing the flag and costing the Lions for being aggressive. I think the only move really I would have maybe made was two more players on offense, maybe keep a Chase uh, Chase Coda on the roster, one of the two with Coda or Drummond and let them develop. One more receiver and one less linebacker. I don't think that if you would have waived Anthony Pittman that your linebacking crew, six linebackers, is a little bit excessive. And it's a lot 12, of linebackers. Yeah, and 12 defensive linemen. Yep. Uh, it, it's pretty stout there. So you could have added just two more offensive weapons uh, for, for Ben Johnson right now because it's funny. You're like 21 players, 10 star- mm-hmm. 11 starters and 10 reserves. That's a little bit light for so Ben Johnson like, right now. It's the same deal. When I look at this roster, right, and I start going through the subunits on this roster, I was shocked that there's only two running backs. Like that is a position that is built – on attrition, basically, right? Like these guys are in car crashes basically every single snap. So there's going to be injuries. There's going to be guys that get nicked up. If they don't do anything to add another running back, 
I guarantee that you could see Khalif Raymond in the backfield, or you'll see Amonra St. Brown in the back backfield. They will somehow devise a way to to get those guys into a more of a running back role than a wide receiving role, which then brings me to the wide receivers. You've got five wide receivers, and you knew Marvin Jones was going to make it. You knew Josh Reynolds was going to make it because he's boys with Jared Goff, and they have a connection. Amonra St. Brown is your best wide receiver, and Khalif Raymond, they just inked to a deal. Antoine Green is a guy that they ended up drafting and they're going to take a chance on him. But after that, I was surprised that nobody else got a look. Uh, a guy like a Chase Coda or um, even even a, a Maurice Alexander who had a really nice kick return in the preseason. You're, you're looking for that fifth and sixth wide receiver to basically provide you something on special teams. Antoine Green must be that guy because when I go through the rest of the roster, I'm a little bit shocked. There, there's really nobody else there that I'm like, yeah, that guy is going to be able to, to take it to the house for you. Um, I mean, obviously, you've got uh, um, Khalif Raymond who who has a role in the punt return, but we're talking kickoffs here. I thought for sure they would do something different. Um, look, Khalif Raymond could spell more time on the on the special teams units, but I was just surprised that they didn't have more wide receivers. You have this 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 bunch of linebackers i was surprised that Pittman made it as well i feel like five linebackers is fine you can go into the season with that and then you have 12 defensive linemen and when you look at the defensive linemen you've got guys like romeo aquara and julian aquara those guys you can kind of put in a in a in a pseudo linebacker role those guys can be off ball edge rushers that you can have lining up and in, in dropping back into coverage if you have to you know, I think when we think edge rushers, you're thinking Aiden Hutchinson, you're thinking John Kaminsky, uh, you're, you're thinking James Houston. They even tried James Houston kind of off the ball and standing up, uh, trying to get him to drop back into coverage. So I, I think you've got some depth there. You know, I, I don't necessarily know if 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 you need to have Charles Harris, Josh Pascal, Julian Aquara, uh, Romeo Aquara. I, I feel like there's a lot of guys there. And yeah, that's a position that can get nicked up and can get beat up. And it's always better to have more than not enough, but at what cost? Because now you're starting to fill out these 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 positions on on the defensive side of the ball, and you're taking away from the offense. So I was surprised at how they allocated a lot of these players and what that meant for sacrificing other guys, other positions of need on the offense. And, and like you said, when you look at guys who got cut, I was surprised Sterling Thomas got cut. I was surprised that Chase Lucas got released as well. I mean, Chase Lucas is coming off of a pretty good game for his third preseason game, and they said, no, we're, we're going in a different direction. Look, I think Stephen Gilmore proved he deserves to be on this team. Khalil Dorsey, I'm not sure. I feel like Stephen Gilmore outperformed him. I feel like Chase Lucas in his last game had a really good showing. So who am I to question what the, what the coaches are doing here? But I was surprised with some of the moves that they made, some of the roster moves that they made. It did have me scratching my head a little bit. But I think when you start looking at the roster as a whole, there's some definite weak links on this roster. What stands out to you as as a few of the weak links on this roster with the way it's currently constructed? And like we've talked about, we both believe this is going to change before we get to, to Kansas City. We both believe that there's going to be more moves that are going to be made. I expect them to go out and pick up another running back and add them to the to the running back room. I expect them to possibly target maybe another wide receiver. So you'll be seeing a couple guys coming and going here over the next, what, week, 10 days or so before we get to – to Kansas City, but what what unit or what units surprise you and and have you kind of scratch your head saying, man, that's a really weak unit on this team? Yeah, it is probably right off the bat. It's the kicking situation. When you hear on roster cutdown day that the team is still looking to trade potentially for a kicker and you can't lure Robbie Gould in, the man is ultra picky. My God, what's he waiting for? Is he waiting for a caviar entrance and a lot of invites? The man is ultra picky in, in coming back to – the NFL. So I does it, does it, it surprise I, you that the that the kicking is, is such a problem? Like going back to last year, I was surprised when they let uh, Patterson go. Right, I thought he was he was the best kicker on this team, and he had a pretty decent year in in Jacksonville. They end up trading for him, bringing him back in, and now they're looking to move on from him. I, I just don't know if it's going to get any better for you. Like I feel like Patterson's a, a, a decent enough kicker. Look, he is he is no Justin Tucker. Very few guys are Justin Tucker. He's no Jason Hansen. 
Very few guys are Jason Hansen. I feel like he's good enough. He he will give you basically in that forty yard range, the the the, the forty to the forty nine range. I feel like the guy is incredibly accurate. Now, when you get into the fifties, it's a bit of a coin flip with him, and, and so I'm surprised that there is this much backlash from this coaching staff with this with this kicker. I, I don't know what you expected. On top of that, if you look at what they did with their kicking game. You kind of put yourself in this spot. Like you brought back Bagley. He wasn't any good last year. You went and you grabbed the guy from the XFL and he is what he is. Again, Patterson's probably the best guy in the room. I don't know what you're trying to do. I don't know why you don't get Robbie Gold in here earlier and you just don't pay the man what he wants. What, what he wants. If you believe he is an answer or if he is better than what you have. Otherwise, I'm not sure why there's such a big deal with the kicking game. Help me understand that because the, that's all you heard about basically on on Monday and on Tuesday is the Lions are trying to move on from Patterson and they're willing to trade assets. They're willing to give up pieces, future pieces to go get a kicker because they feel like that is one of the weakest links on this team. I just don't get it. I don't see it as a as a major as a major downfall of this team. I don't see it as a as a as a massive deal. I think Patterson will be fine. Yeah, it's um it's a situation in which they're caught in the middle. You know, Riley Patterson's developing, but he's not exactly at the level you would want for a team that's on the verge of the playoffs. You know what I mean? He's like a kicker that you can rely on from 30 to 48 pretty consistently. But in today's NFL, defenses tend to play. A lot of Ben don't break. They clamp down around the, the red zone and, and, and stuff like that. So a lot of times you're forced to kick, uh, uh, and where the kickers make their money is from 50 and beyond. And he's been working on strengthening his leg. His kickoffs are a little bit better. But in terms of consistency, he doesn't have the same big booming leg that Parker Romo had. And it was clear when the football would come off of his leg, it would boom off of his leg. And that's what you wanted. But the problem was he couldn't maneuver it to be straight consistently. And he tailed off right at the last week, right when the competition got hot. Romo was missing 35 yarders. And you're like, shit, you know, it's, it's never good to have a booming leg, but you can't control where the ball's going. And unfortunately, Patterson can control where the ball's going, but at, he missed a field goal up from, from 53 yards out, and his worst game was in front of a nationally televised audience. And then you realize you move on from Michael Badgley only to bring him back to the practice squad, and you realize that the kicking game is a concern, but it's not to the level of, I think that if you're at 50 yards, you just go for it. And the odds indicate nowadays that you get a little bit of forgiveness by just going for it more often, that's actually a lot of times the best strategy. Unfortunately, you don't want history to repeat itself because you remember the Minnesota game where yeah. Dan Campbell got caught in the middle there and he's like, shit, and he let uh, Patterson go out there and do some things and the kicker missed. And it, it then caused a bunch of situations. You bring in another kicker in Badgley and it just became a messy situation. And yeah, it is interesting that you know, a lot of people have brought it up, too, on our Twitter page, at Detroit Podcast. What was one of the staples of the Lions? It was kicker. You had um, Jason Hansen kick forever. You, you had Eddie do his thing for a long period of time. So you realize you go almost 20 years without worrying about the kicker. Now you finally put together a playoff team, and you can't find a kicker. So it's kind of the irony of Detroit Lions football that let's just hope for now that the kicking situation is not one in which it's going to come and bite the Lions in the ass. So I look at it like that and I say, hey, you hope that Patterson proves the team right because for some reason they love him. And I would have moved on from both of them and tried to bring in Gould, the experienced veteran. But it just for whatever reason, he, he ain't signing on the dotted line and he's being ultra picky. So we'll see. We'll see. But I would go with this early strategy of just going for it and, and seeing what you got to do. Do you think that the Lions will be in any kind of way regretful of the early roster decisions? I don't think so. I think that it's fair to to rely on the defense early on, and you have just enough offensive weapons. The issue is you can't really sustain any injuries on offense uh, because of the fact that, hey, you have uh, you know offensive linemen, you only got so many of them, eight, and there's five starters. So you realize, oh boy, let's hope nobody goes down because the depth on the offense, it, it went from being really a strength to being something that you got to be like, whoa, wait a minute here. If teams lock in on the Lions offense and there's a little bit of regression, that's going to be a problem scoring points. I mean, I think it's a concern, right? It has to be a concern. It, it, you, 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 you play this game that is ultra violent and you see 
constantly guys are injured. Guys are, are limping into games sometimes and they're not performing at their best because they're beat up, but they have to be out there. So that then takes away from your production and how, how productive you are on the field. So I think it has to be a concern it, to me going into the, going into the season with only two running backs. I'm not sure what the thought process is there because if you only have, if you only have two of these guys in, they are similar, but I think there are some differences there, right? I think Montgomery, and you and I had this conversation on Sunday. I think Montgomery is going to be a guy who's going to chew up a lot of yards. He's going to be essentially your workhorse, whereas you've got Gibbs as your as your 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 boom guy. He's the guy who's going to help take it to the house. He's the guy who's going to explode and help pick up yards at 15, 20, 30 a clip. Montgomery has it in him. But I think we're kind of far away from when he was doing that. I believe he was he was good at that. Maybe his rookie year, uh, possibly his his sophomore year in the league. He hasn't really been that player in the last couple of years, and that's part of the reason why Chicago moved away from him. If you remember when he was in Chicago, he had a guy named Tariq Cohen. Tariq Cohen was the boom guy. Tariq Cohen was the guy who could take it to the house for you, whereas Montgomery was the guy who would just chew stuff up. So I think you take one of those guys out. All of a sudden, their roles now change. They've got to do a little bit more. And I don't know if either one is as good as the other one at what each other does. So it, it becomes a bit of an issue and a bit of a concern there. On top of it, you're seeing what this team is having to do with, with JMO being out, right? You go through those wide receivers. Go through that wide receiver list. And who's the guy who threatens you down the field? None of those guys threaten you down the field. You, you, you have Amonra St. Brown, who, like I said before, your best wide receiver. You have uh, Marvin Jones, who Amon, who, who is a, a lesser version of Amonra St. Brown, right? He's, he's, a, he's the wily veteran who pretty much does a lot of the same things, does those mid routes and a lot of the underneath stuff, has the ability to go deep. But at this point in his career, that's not what he is. It's not what he does. Khalif Raymond, Khalif Raymond is, is a tool. He's a utility guy. He can do a lot of different stuff, can line up in the slot, can line up out wide. He does have speed, but he doesn't have breakaway, breakaway speed that's going to, to rip it down the field and take the top off. That's not what he does. He's a guy who you get the ball in his hands, in space, and watch him make guys miss. And then Antonio, um, Antonio Green, we'll see. You know, like he had a good enough preseason to make the team, but are you really counting on him for, for big plays down the field? And don't even get me started on what Josh Reynolds is. Josh Reynolds isn't that guy. So I, I think when you when you look at the, the, the offense as a whole, and if you were to lose a guy like Amonra St. Brown, all of a sudden everything is completely different. Getting yards is no longer as simple as it was. Things become much more difficult. Things become much more tight. You, you, and speaking of tight, you look at the tight ends. You got three tight ends. You got Brock Wright, Sam Laporta, and James Mitchell. I think we're all excited for Sam Laporta because you know what Brock Wright is. And James Mitchell, I feel like, is still developing. If Sam Laporta goes down, now do I think they'll be able to manufacture uh, – yards with 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 tight ends yeah i do but again your game plan changes and things have to then adjust so i think if you are uh if you are ben johnson if you are brad holmes if you are dan campbell there has to be concern with how light your offensive side of the ball is especially in those skilled positions i think that's where it's it's incredibly light is in those skilled positions i like what they did with the offensive linemen if you look at the offensive linemen You've got your five. This will be the first time. You realize this is going to be the first time we get to see this offensive line unit the way it was originally intended to look. This will be the first time in three years because every year one of these guys is nicked up. Every year one of these guys is on IR. Every year one of these guys is banged up. And then you look at their their you look at the 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 the, the substitutes right. Graham Glasgow is a guy who can play center and play guard. There's flexibility there. Matt Nelson, a guy who can play tackle or can play guard. Uh, Colby Swordsdale, I believe he can just kind of play all over the line at this point. So you've got flexibility there with your backups, and I like that. But again, every year, we're talking about guys getting nicked up right now. Every year for the last two years, we've not been able to see what this offensive line unit is supposed to look like. This will be the first time in three years. So I think that kind of tells you where where the atrophy comes in and kind of guys getting beat up and how when you have a small unit, a small group, like I said, wide receivers, there's only five of them, and really one of them is the class. And he's heads and tails above everybody else. 
he goes out, all of a sudden it looks completely different and this team will struggle to get points. So yeah, I think there has to be a definite concern with, with what they're putting on the field, what they have on this roster. Yeah, it is. And now you're, you know, by, by the time we record next, we'll be previewing the Chiefs. And so every decision is key. And you're looking at it, yeah, you might get lucky and not have one of the Chiefs' key defenders on the roster, which is crazy to think about how lucky you could get. But they still got Patrick Mahomes. Yeah. And you still would think, just heading into that game at first glance, that you would believe that you just need to score a lot of points. And you realize, okay, you're going to be counting on a rookie in Jameer Gibbs, a rookie tight end in Sam Laporta to be in sync right away game one when the lights are the brightest. Mm, maybe it would have been good to have uh, Jamison Williams uh, on this roster to have a player with a little bit of experience under the bright lights, but uh, that's not the case. So we'll see now as the preparation takes place. And I think the first running back added will be Craig Reynolds once an injury situation takes place. I'm curious to see what the 16-man practice squad looks like. I didn't really buy into too much of the James Houston rumors that popped up. I just thought that it was just somebody over at PFF looking at potentially a surprise move and throwing James Houston's name out there, even though he is kind of one-dimensional right now as he's learning the craft, at, like you said, at Sam Linebacker. When your trick is being able to sack the quarterback, no team in their right mind, unless you got a first-rounder and a player at a position of need, would consider it, which we wrote about at All Lions, but people uh, kind of got out up in arms. And guys, look, it's just debating sports. And one aspect of sports that everybody loves, and it's a big, huge water cooler component, is just talking about a player and saying, hey, do you still want him? Could you flip him? Could you uh, take a player you got in the sixth round and get a first-rounder for him, second-rounder for him? So remember that pay attention to, really, if if your gut tells you this sounds far-fetched, then probably it is. But it is always worthwhile that GMs, you don't think someone called and said, hey, is James Houston available? And Brad Holmes said, yeah, for a first? And they all said, yeah, we're not giving it for a one-dimensional guy. And he's like, okay, call me later, bye. And that's how it goes. It's three seconds, and they move on about their day. It's not as emotionally invested as a lot of you guys think it is. And um, that's just the way it is. That's how we always have approached it. That's how I have always approached it is look at it like a GM. One day the guy's on the roster, he gets hurt, boom, we offer him a settlement, he's gone, never to be heard from again. NFL, not for long. That's how it goes. And if James Houston doesn't get a sack a game this year and he kind of falls off and teams figure him out. Six rounders that don't produce don't last in the league all that long. And uh, that's just the nature of the, of the beast. And the Lions will, will go out and find two more edge rushers, whether it be the waiver wire or in the draft. And that's the way that it's, it's a, and you talk about fast nature. You don't get like uh, two years to figure it out. You get sometimes a game, sometimes in the case of quarterbacks, you get a possession and if you jack it up and throw a pick six, your time in the league is over. And for that, that's the pressure of the NFL, and that's the, the high standard that the league has. And that's why roster construction is so interesting to debate, is every decision is key. And the Lions, yeah, Brad Holmes deserves trust, and it, it is unique a little bit to play toward the strength of the defense and to, to really hone in on that, and that's the way they want to play. But you still need to have pieces on offense, and I'm curious to see how they perform right away, especially how fast maybe do they look at wide receiver, who makes up. Obviously, I think uh, maybe Dylan Drummond will definitely be on the practice squad uh, to see which players develop early on in the system. Uh, Maybe a Maurice Alexander or somebody else that that maybe if if an injury happens, who who steps up. So the initial thoughts are positive. I think that there there are definite concerns, but I just think that right now there's still a high level of trust in regards to the Lions, especially now heading into week one. So we'll see how this roster shakes out over the next 72 hours as players become available, as the decisions change, as the Lions start taking the field for practice. Make sure you stay tuned to Detroit Sports Podcast and All Lions. Visit us on Twitter at Detroit Podcast. Now, cuz, you know who I do not have any trust in right now? And unfortunately, I hate to say it, it is crazy. You put Michigan State on the list, and I'm like, shit, I haven't read a single thing other than the fact that the prognosticators are thinking it's a 5-6 win team and two of the best players left the squad. The quarterback and the wide receiver and Keon Coleman is and Peyton Thorne are not on the roster. And you're like, is the defense going to be any better? Is the offense going to come out uh, and, and get back into the, uh, you know, the, the new age now of passing the ball and being able to e- expand the running concepts and, and things like that? So 
entering into this topic, I'll be honest with you, straightforward. In the average five years, I would have maybe read like 400 articles about Michigan State. I maybe read five, if that, because I'm a diehard Spartan fan. But looking at it the way in which you hear Mel Tucker complain about NIL, you see the turnover, you see the kind of the way in which they're kind of approaching this year. You don't really get a buy year, but it just kind of has a feel of like, this is, it just feels like the way it's been spun. Like, this is Mel Tucker's first year. Like, he's just showing up there, looking at the roster, kind of overhauling it. I'm not confident in the offensive coordinator, not confident at all in the defensive coordinator. And I'm sitting here going, this is the most depressed I think I've been about Spartan football. And it just feels like it's an impending rough season where I think Spartan fans will be ecstatic with eight wins. I'm like, at this point in time. I think eight wins might be high. Yeah. Like we, if you get eight wins, like that is like I feel like you're I feel like you're hitting above your head. This really feels like and like speaking of Mel Tucker, like the comments that that have come out from East Lansing, it really sounds like he's whining and just kind of creating excuses. And, and I'm not here trying to, to to bash on on Michigan State. I'm not trying to bash on Spartans. I'm not trying to bash on Mel Tucker. But that's what it sounds like. It, it sounds like a guy who came in with a lot of bravado, had a really good season. That was awesome. And then has kind of struggled to, to put it all back together after the one good season. You know, we, we, we see this in college football. There's always a team or two that kind of bubbles up. Uh, every now and again, you'll get a, you'll get an Iowa team that bubbles up and makes it to, to the Big Ten championship game. Or you'll get a... You get a Wisconsin team that will put two seasons together. That that's really really good. Or every now and then Illinois will kind of hit above their head, and it feels like that year with Mel Tucker where he had K nine. He just kind of hit above his head, and he hasn't been able to figure out how to do it again. And it's like he's he's sitting at a desk and he's got a Rubik's cube, and he's he's kind of turning the, the 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 Rubik's cube around, trying to get all the colors to line up, and he just can't. And so now he's trying to explain things away. I mean, that's kind of how I took it. If I was a Michigan State fan, I'd be I'd be pretty upset. I would be nervous about this season. Like you said, if you can get eight wins, that's a damn fine season for Michigan State. Man, it's so disappointing. And it, it just stinks, too, because it has a feel of like, okay, knowing Michigan waited, they were patient, they gave, um, they gave uh, Michigan's Jim Harbaugh so many years before he won the Big Ten and so many years before he beat Ohio State. It just thinks because so much is going on and there is such a hyper focus on college football, but and there's been so many, you know, talks now about expansion and what that's gonna look like. It does kind of have the feel of like NIL kind of not helping Michigan State, where you thought that, you know what, hey, you got a couple boosters that could sprinkle some dollars. But in the end, the big bad boosters sprinkled all the dollars to the good players. And everybody's like, I, I think the the Keon Coleman one was a a little bit of a, of a situation in which now he was disrespectful leaving, saying that he served a two-year sentence at Michigan State. That, you know, you look at things and, you know, you go, what's going on with the coaching staff? You can't act like Nick Saban if you're Mel Tucker, if you're not Nick Saban. And it might be one of those things where, in principle, you want that tough-nosed coach, but in today's age, you can only get that guy is if he's kind of got that credibility. And Nick Saban started to have a little bit of that cachet coming from the NFL and coming from Michigan State, where he did start to show what he could do at the college level. I think Mel Tucker is battling a little bit of the new age kind of athlete where they don't want to be barked at all the time and they don't want to kind of grind and have these, like Jameer Gibbs said it. He's like, oh, this is way different. And, 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 and in, a, in a sly kind of way, he said, at Alabama, they try to kill us. <laughs> so, what do you think is happening at Michigan State? They're trying to kill the athletes. So, and 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 it's a it's an interesting kind of thought to look at. But what do I expect? First and foremost, don't get your ass beat by Central. Beat Central. Impose your will. You have the better team. Don't lose to Central. After that, I have no fucking clue what's going to happen. They could run off a bunch of wins. They could run off a bunch of losses. I have no idea what it's going to take for this football team to have a better year because I don't see it. I, I could see six wins, and that's it. I could see a, a, a season in which a lot of people are going to start to raise the question of whether Mel Tucker is right as opposed to what's going on with Michigan where everything's coming up roses. 
Yeah, see, I, I think out of this first game against Central, I'm looking to see the strides that the offense has taken, right? There's a reason Peyton Thorne's not here anymore. So who's going to be the quarterback? How is that going to translate on the field? What does the offensive unit look like? Does it take a step forward or or is this just another rebuilding year, right? Are we just kind of trying to put pieces together and and, and just, I don't know, get to the end of the season? I hope that's not what it is. I'm, I'm hoping – it's what is it? Noah Kim comes out and sets the world on fire. And all of a sudden Michigan state looks like they have a good offense, but that's what I'm really looking for. That's what I'm trying to take away from this game on Friday night. And look, we, we talk about this a lot too. It's not so much where you start the season, but it's where you end the season. And I think for both Michigan and Michigan state, these first, these, these, these week one games, I don't really know what you're, what, what you're really trying to, to get out of them. Right? So I've decided that I'm just going to try to pick one thing, and I'm just going to try to to look at that and each week just try to build and build and build until we really get into the meat of the Big Ten season. And once we get there, I, I think you, you will have a pretty good idea of what each one of these teams are and how they're going to do in the Big Ten. But right now, Michigan State taking on Central on Friday night. I want to see the offense take some steps forward. I want to. I believe the starting quarterback is going to be Noah Kim. I have no inside information. I know Mel Tucker hasn't said who it's going to be, but I believe it's going to be Noah Kim. I want to see what he looks like. There were times the, over the last year or so where he would get into a game and he would look pretty decent. And there are times where he would get into a game and he would look in over his head. So having the entire preseason to kind of get in, get going and then kind of working with the wide receivers, working with the offense, really digesting everything and taking it all in. Is he able to build upon that? And what does that offense look like on the field against a team like Central Michigan? That's what I'm going to be looking for on Friday night. Now, when we go to Michigan, they start at noon on Saturday. They're taking on ECU. For me, I need to see Michigan basically come out and plant a flag and say it's all about business. It's all about taking care of what we let slip through our fingers the last two years. I need to see Michigan walking in, punching in at the clock, going, handling their jobs, and then coming back, punching out, and looking to start all over in week two. I need to see a, a very focused and detailed mindset where these guys are, are ready to do work because they know that it's not just this game. It's not just the next game. It's not just the game after that. It's not just the Big Ten championship game. It's not any of those things. It is national championship or bust. That is what I'm looking for. That is the mindset I want to see from Michigan. And look, they're going to be doing it without – their, their head coach for the first three games they are going to be doing it without their offensive coordinator for the first game because suspensions are galore because this team it does whatever this team wants to do because there is no institutional balance with, with the athletic department. So I want to see them put their hard hats on. I want to see them punch in. I want to see them go to work and do work. Yeah, as it should be. It should, high expectations, and I think they have the team to do it. The O-line, the running game, wide receivers. I mean, there really shouldn't be much that should preclude the Wolverines from getting to the Ohio State game and then being in, in a contest where the, the, the winner of that game will advance. Now, do they see, the thing is, is do they have enough high-end talent that will produce in the biggest moments? Maybe, because a lot of the Blue Bloods have quarterbacks that are new, but by then they should be further along. So you have the best quarterback amongst the group, in my opinion. So I think this is probably the year, and maybe we'll put it in manifested, as they say, probably the year you advance and get a win in the playoff and then lose in the, in the championship. That's probably what you can expect and, and not let your heart get broken. Would I be surprised and shocked if they got to the title game and put on a good performance and let Jim Harbaugh right off into the sunset? That's plan A. That's what he would like. That's what he would love to do is to kind of be able to walk off into the sunset having beaten the NCAA and all this noise and, and having to deal with Ward Manuel and, 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 and trying to do that. But it's funny. Can, do you see how masterful he's trying to deflect um, the news away from him? It's like, I can't talk about my suspension. I can't talk oh, yeah. about all the recent decisions I make. But did you know, I'm really thinking these athletes, when you got $4 billion coming in and they're only getting like $2 million, I think they should get like a union and get together and maybe make – $5 billion and, and let's get them to get a revenue share and maybe they could ask for 50% so that we can share a pool with them of $2 billion. And, and it's like, uh, yeah, it's great. Their athletes are getting paid. You know, there's quarterbacks making more than Joe Burrow right now. They're fine. 
you know, what about you? What, what did you guys do? Did you cheat? Did you do this? What happened with Sharon Moore? I don't know about that, but these players are not are mistreated. <laughs> so it's masterful deflection, masterful use of PR to try and uh, spin this shit. But in Dude, the end, he he is a washing machine because he is yes. he is just the spin machine all day long. In the end, it, I don't, it's it's unreal. But it's so true. You do it so often. I don't even care anymore. I don't care. Whatever. Serve your suspension. Self impose. Do this. Do that. It's for me now. It's all under the umbrella of if you're not cheating, you're not trying. And good for you for cheating. And it wasn't something where it was like slipping millions of dollars. It's just kind of like making calls and and doing some recruiting things you're not supposed to do. And yeah, I don't care. You're, you're treating the players well. You're winning games. Do your thing. I just would I just would have owned up to it and and just said it instead of all this because you look at it and you say it's a lot of noise surrounding Michigan. People are not going to stop asking those questions. It's going to be asked pretty much every presser. And you get a couple weeks off. I mean, you know, you can't even name a head coach. You got six of them now. Behind the the headset, you know, a couple here for a half, a couple here for a half. You're like, oh, okay, whatever, dude. What kind of kind of circus are you running over there? But the good thing is, is you can run a circus if you win football games, and that's what's gonna happen. And I just feel bad for for me, college football games. You know, I'm, I used to be, I used to try and get to as many as humanly possible with a media pass, but four hour games, traffic, being busy, wanting to see the kids grow up more. I'm oh, bro! Watching life. it at home and just having yeah. all the all, having all the amenities of home yeah, is I'm doing. so much. That's better. what I'm doing. I'm only, Dude. I'm only going to two Michigan games and two Spartan games, as opposed I've, to six and six the last couple of years. So uh, I, I've got a cousin who we we regularly go to a Michigan game a year, and it, it, it it's a tradition. And I don't even enjoy it, man. Yeah. Like it's a good time going hanging out with him. It's a good time right. going to the to the to, to tailgate, but like. Geez, it's so much money to get there. Then you got to set up, and then you got to do the whole thing. And then I, if you've ever watched the game in Michigan Stadium, good luck because oh. you you legit get eighteen inches of a seat. And I don't know about you, but I got a pretty big ass. You get eighteen inches of a seat. That's what you're there to sit on, and it is a a metal uh, uh, bench basically. It, it is uncomfortable, and then you're all stacked on top of each other. It's just it's. It's annoying. I much rather sit around at home in my underwear, eating my own food that I could heat up whenever I want. I can use my own bathroom. I don't have to say excuse me to anybody. I don't have to worry about anybody being in front of me. No way, dude. You got it. You got it figured out. Stay home. Watch it at home. It's yes. okay. Yes. It's a better experience, anyways. You catch more watching it at home. Yes, yes. It, the, the comfort and the drive. They they shut down weird roads. The 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 walk I got to walk from Ann Arbor is like Spartans at least you get it like a two minute walk the Ann Arbor walk I got to walk like at least a mile and a half from the stadium to the car and then it takes forever to get through Ann Arbor it's like ooh so and then and then for if you are an actual working beat writer the games go till like eleven forty then you got to yep. talk it's that it, it, forget that so not doing that. Um, thankfully we can go and just observe the players and it was just a small world because I remember I covered a game with Adrian Martinez and got a chance to talk to him at training camp and just kind of kick, kick some big 10 ideas knowing that I saw him play in the big house and I saw him play, you know, Michigan state. So it's, uh, it, it is, it ends up tying together, you know, when I can finally put the pieces together, like, Oh yeah, I, I watched that guy play in college and now he's in the NFL and I can put two and two together. <laughs> so it's good to do. And and thankfully the universities have lessened their restrictive nature on podcasts and they let me in. So it's good. I'm very happy. And, uh, uh I'm looking forward to seeing Michigan, Ohio state and, uh, seeing Michigan state play down at Ford field. But other than that, yeah, the travel and all that kind of stuff and the gas prices. Oh, oof. listen, we don't want to make it a complete session. It's, it's, it's obviously something that you can do better and it, it is true. It is the game day experience when you just look at it versus what you can accomplish at home. It's not It's not the same. And I don't yep. think there's anything you can do to make it that way other than just the camaraderie, having the opportunity to catch up and celebrate with a lot of your friends. Other than that, the, the, the timeouts are long and the weather, if it's rough, oh, you're at Ann Arbor. You're an open air stadium, baby. Mm-hmm. You ain't get, you got you to gotta run to get those that, that shelter. So we'll see how it plays out. But college football season's here. I'm excited for it. But I'm not as excited for the alma mater as I am 
as I have been in the past, but I'll be, I'll be excited for the Georgias and the, and the Alabamas and what they do, the high flying and, and potent offenses. Obviously, Caleb Williams looking at, is he going to be worth the number one overall pick? And then the best part is when you cover the NFL is, okay, which players could the Lions be interested in? Is there a, another Iowa tight end they want to get? Is there a quarterback that they maybe could, could look at? So that provides another avenue of, okay, forget the collective spirit that I have for Michigan State. Well, hopefully they'll overachieve. But I'll look at it from the perspective of which players could Brad Holmes target. So first and foremost, Brad Holmes loves Alabama. So let's go and watch what they do because that's where he watches. So that'll be a fun time and uh, it'll be a good opportunity to at least peek into college football. Make sure you follow Adam on Twitter at Adam RSGROZ. Follow the network at Detroit Podcast. Make sure you interact. Hit us up. Reply to the comments. Reply to the questions. It's always good. Thank you for the reposts and all the fun stuff that we're doing on the X platform or the Twitter platform or whatever the hell we're calling it nowadays. One last thing, cuz. Yep. Obviously, being on TweetDeck the last 10 years has been fun where you get information. Now that, you know, Elon Musk whacked it and it's no longer there, I'm not on Twitter as much. It's actually not so bad. I don't get information as fast as I used to. You're kind of reliant on the notification thing that goes on. But the blessing is, is that, you know what, maybe for the good of humanity, we don't all got to be glued on Twitter as much as we've been over the last few years because whatever Elon Musk has done to Twitter has been ass. Terrible. Oh, it's no longer any fun. <laughs> it's no longer. It's fun and funny when you look for the right stuff. And I follow all the best accounts. I follow the Internet Hall of Fame. I follow Boys Will Be Boys. And they, they produce all the effing hilarious stuff that Daily Loud, all the shit that produces funny stuff. So I follow that. But in terms of looking at how it was for the media where you can get a great sense of um, information from TweetDeck, it's gone, gone, poof. And so it's been better. I'm on Twitter way less, and it's it's great. It allows you to uh, branch out and do other things. So with that said, podcasting time has come to an end. Hit us up on the X platform at Detroit Podcast, and we'll have a fun conversation uh, in the world of Detroit sports. Thanks, cause I can't wait to preview Lions Chiefs next week.